I just want to thank our hard money people, Robert Thomas and Adam Hartfield from Merchants Mortgage Northwest for being here. And I'll let you guys go ahead and start your class. Great, thanks. Awesome. Well, we we appreciate you having us. Um, so I was looking at the at the list of participants, and I it's about half and half of people I know who have experience, people who I don't know. So we definitely want to make this this talk, you know, not just talking at you. We'd love it to be more interactive. Uh, so first off, so if you have questions, I mean, if there's a way that you can say the questions, you know, cut us off mid conversation happy to you know stop and answer it you know I, I really like these to be more of a dialogue than us just being talking heads um, especially with this format for you know half an hour or however long we're going to be talking um, so with that said a quick introductions i'm bob thomas uh, i run the pacific northwest for merchants mortgage uh, we're a debt fund headquartered in denver um, we do about half a million i mean ha sorry half a billion dollars give or take uh, worth of hard money a year um, across the western u.s mainly um, mostly fix and flip residential kind of properties uh, but we do dabble in construction um, as well as different commercial kind of bridge lending and, and creative commercial stuff we did a deal with um, with aj and chris uh, they did a little syndicated um, syndicated value add multifamily deal for them so that was another commercial property but uh, i've been with the company for three years now before then i was a, a commercial real estate broker with cbre down in the bay area um, and I've got a background as a, I'm a formerly a CPA, uh, so I've got kind of an accounting, public accounting finance background. Um, and Adam uh, is, it works with me in Portland. Adam, can you tell me about yourself? Yeah, my name's Adam Hartfall. I work with Bob. I've been with him now for, yeah, two and a half, three years-ish. And um, kind of have a little bit more of a, a background from the traditional banking side and came over to Hard Money because uh, a lot less red tape. And um, I kind of focus on the Oregon, Washington area, and I'll just be kind of uh, walking you through uh, more of the um, overview of hard money, how it's used, when it's used, and stuff like that. And uh, Bob will kind of start our, our presentation off. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, I, and this very well may be um, something you guys know all about, but I'm going to take it from a level of you know, you, you've never done hard money before. Maybe you're just starting to look at fixing flips or, you know, some sort of real estate investing and kind of take us from there all the way through to get you a really good sense of what hard money is, how it can be used and how it fits into the bigger picture of real estate investing. Um, so to start out, right, I mean, the the way that I, I do a lot of real estate investing as well as doing the lending. Um, I'll do, uh, like I've, I've, I've done syndications on ground up apartment buildings. Um, you know, I, I own some value add and, and stabilized units uh, around Oregon. So, you know, I'm, I'm not only a lender, but I also kind of do this uh, full time. Um, and, and so when I look at a, at a property, right, it's, it's like you, you look at um, the total cost of what a property is going to take and how do you finance that? So if we look at a million dollar property, say you can buy that million dollar property all cash, right? If you have a million bucks and you got nothing better to do with it, you can put it in there. And if you sell it for 1.5 in a couple of years, you make 500 grand. That's great. But if you look at your return on your money, right, you, you, you put in a million bucks to make 500 grand. So you ended up making like a 50% return on your money. Um, and, and then when you start looking at how leverage works into that, how debt or other, other ways to finance the property, um, basically the whole game in my mind and a lot of our clients is reducing the cash that you need to bring in, whether it's through getting a lender to give you a loan or bringing in an equity partner or some other way of, of not using your own cash. So instead of spending a million dollars of cash and making 500 grand and getting a 50% return, maybe you only put in a hundred grand and you borrowed, raised, whatever, 900 to make that deal work. And then when you sold in five years, uh, you know, I mean, there's cost and whatever, but your hundred grand made 500 grand and, and that's a five X on your money instead of a 50% return. So when you're thinking about like, what is hard money? What are other financing vehicles? Like, I think the biggest thing to think about is, all right, how do I leverage other people's money or other creative structures to get into deals with as little cash as possible while making as big of a percentage return on the back end as possible? Um, and that's where hard money comes into play. So you can look at it like um, you, you could have a really rich friend who brings in 900 grand and gives it to you and you bring in 100 and you go do the deal. You could come to us and we would do the same and, and it would all work. So there's a lot of different ways to get there. But at the end of the day, finding a, an easy 
relatively cost-effective solution uh, to get someone else's money to help fund your deal is kind of like the very high-level concept of, of how any real estate financing, but specifically hard money, um, works. And so we're going to go into a little bit more around, you know, how merchants as a lender, but generally hard money lenders, look at deals, how we would, you know, size loans, um, you know, would, would we give you 80% of the cost of a deal, would we give you 90? Um, what would be the difference there? Uh, you know, what would it cost you on an interest rate, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll get into all of that, but at a high level, right? Like if you're buying real estate, my thesis is you want to put down as little of your own cash as possible and get as high of a percentage return on that money um, as possible. So from there, I think Adam's going to take it over a little bit, talk a little bit about our underwriting requirements, and then I'll jump back in on some kind of creative financing uh, structures that, that I've seen used pretty effectively. And yeah, like Bob was saying, I'll, I'll dive back into kind of more the, the basics and how uh, hard money is used on different properties and stuff like that. But as we mentioned in the beginning, feel free to just interrupt me anytime uh, and ask any questions. Um, we like the interactiveness of these, these calls. Um, but to start off, uh, hard money is really helpful for when you're looking at uh, non-bankable properties, uh, properties like Bob mentioned that are fix and flip or uh, that need um, a lot more work than traditional banks will be willing to finance, um, such as like that duplex that uh, that other gentleman mentioned out in Hillsborough. If he wasn't able to get that done because of traditional guidelines, we would be able to come in and help and, and kind of fill that gap for uh, between traditional and, and, and what he needs and get that property acquired. Um, the other nice uh, thing about hard money is the leverage. Uh, as Bob mentioned, we're willing to advance uh, quite a bit more and get a little bit higher on that uh, loan to value, loan to cost scale. Um, we'll look at uh, typically uh, anywhere from 85 to 90 percent on some, uh, some projects that people look at and uh, really helps keep more money in your pocket and um, you know leverage that uh, that uh, return like Bob was mentioning um, also uh, many different people come to us that are not traditionally financeable uh, you go to a normal bank and they want to see you know however many years taxes uh, strong income on taxes and uh, you know lots of reserves cash reserves and then things set aside uh, in that manner and where we're able to kind of uh, work with business owners and people who try to, you know, really minimize their taxable income on their taxes. And that way um, we're able to kind of help people out by, by reading through that and uh, understanding that, you know, this is more of an asset based deal than um, a complete underwriting package like a traditional bank would have. Um, and I, I think, I think a good thing to, a good way to think about it is um, like if it makes sense, right like like we're definitely a make sense blender we don't have this box like adam came from the banking world where like you had to check all these boxes and if, if one didn't make it like like out of the 10 the guy's gone like we don't look at it like that i mean we charge more than a bank but it's like all right does the property look good are, are the numbers generally there like the guy you know might have not had a bunch of money on his taxes one year because he was doing something else but he's got decent liquidity you know as, like if you triangulate all these various pieces does the deal make sense to lend on we're not we're not as structured as as even some other hard money lenders who you know if you get some of those really cheap uh cheap rate hard money guys like they have these boxes you need to fit inside or else they just have to pass on the deal and i think that's where you know you see a difference between banks and hard money and even some hard money lenders versus others bob yeah. what or i mean adam one question that i had for you on that topic was if someone is that you know not financeable quote unquote with a typical bank um are you guys still able to offer similar loan programs that a bank would no, we're more of a short-term lender. Uh, we help with people acquire properties quickly and uh, make those necessary improvements or do the construction, and then we'll help guide them towards a, a traditional uh, long-term takeout. Um, we're just there to basically close quickly and then provide uh, additional options that banks can't. Cool. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would say that, uh, and we'll get into it uh, kind of at the end, but uh, we're going to get into when you don't want to use hard money. And, you know, I, I think hard money is, is more of that, that bridge financing, like Adam said, between, you know, acquisition and stabilization. But once you get stabilized, you know, you likely want to get a permanent loan that's at a relatively reasonable, potentially amortizing 
uh, you know, kind of structure, a reasonable rate and amortizing structure, um, and, and really have cash flow in mind if you're going to keep it. Um, or you sell the thing. I mean, most of our, a majority of our clients don't end up keeping the properties. They acquire, rehab, and, and then end up selling and, and pocketing that cash. Cool. And that's also where um, the ability for us to close quickly is a, another big uh, benefit of hard money is uh, we can look at closing on a property anywhere from, you know, probably you know, three to seven days on, on average. But like Bob mentioned, sometimes we've done even, you know, less than a day. So uh, it really depends on the, the situation and what we can do and how the uh, client looks. But uh, as we've mentioned before, it's, it's all about that common sense underwriting. If uh, there's a way to, to make it work and it, it makes sense, we'll consider doing it. Um, we, I've, I've closed two deals in 18 hours and, and they were both, we post closed the appraisal we had done deals with the borrowers before, so we had their financials. But I mean, literally it was just pull a prelim title report, get docs out, sign fund, and then basically figure out all the underwriting on the back end. But that was us having a relationship with the borrower for a while um, and the property looked, looked decent. But uh, I mean, we ended up getting the 90% leverage at, at our standard pricing, um, closing in 18 hours. So I was, I was pretty happy to be able to do that multiple times. That is awesome. Are there credit requirements or are, are your credit requirements the same as a traditional bank's credit requirements? We're not going to have the same uh, exact requirements. We do like to see uh, a credit report and the fact that, uh, you know, we eventually there is a number that will, will be a, like a, a line will be drawn, but the, you know, a lot of people, anything over 620, 650 is fine. Uh, as long as, you know, like we said, if it makes sense, if there's an explanation behind it, or if there's a more of an understanding, that's great. Um, we just, uh, we like to see, you know, that people do pay their bills and the, the higher the credit, the better, but uh, we're willing to work with folks um, in most situations. And then yeah, I, I think the if you see like, the, 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 there's a big difference between like uh, if your credit score is dinged for utilization, like you've got a bunch of outstanding credit card debt, like we're cool with that. But if you've got judgments or a recent bankruptcy or tax liens, you know, things that or a, a ton of derogatory items like late payments, you know, it, it, that makes sense what Adam is saying where like, you know, do we think that our borrower is going to, to pay the bills? If they've just got some debt on their balance sheet, like, that's okay. But if they're historically not paying bills or have tax outstanding, you know, that's where it starts to get dicey from a credit perspective. Mm -hmm. And then there was one other question. What, what is the typical interest rate and the terms on some of yours? If you guys are going to get into that later, um, feel free to defer. But that question just came in as well. I think we'll get into that a little bit later because it's a little more nuanced right now, especially given COVID and various states. Um, but I think Adam, you should probably just say continue. And I think you'll definitely hit on that. Cool. Yeah. Bob will follow up with that towards the end. Um, but to touch a little bit more just on underwriting and how we look at deals versus traditional banks, um, we'll, uh, we do have some uh, underwriting guidelines like any lender they have to follow. Um, we are more of like a, an institutional hard money lender where you know, we like to see kind of a, a wide spectrum of someone's um, kind of portfolio assets, uh, credit, taxes, stuff like that. But with that ability to do that, we are able to offer quite a bit uh, lower rates than, let's say, like a private individual who's charging, you know, substantially higher and what, you know, a lot of people think of hard, hard money. Um, so we, uh, we typically like to, to look at that kind of stuff because we are able to offer that, that higher leverage, you know, that, you know, 10% down, 15% down, things like that. Um, and then um, just to kind of also touch on the, um, approval process and how long that takes. Um, the nice thing with uh, hard money is we're able to typically get a, a deal approved and a proof of funds letter out within a day. Um, sometimes uh, give or take on the size of the project, maybe a little bit longer. But uh, with that being said, it's, it allows you to write offers and almost act as cash because typically title companies take longer to do their side of stuff than we take to, to fully underwrite and fund a deal. And a, a little a little piece there for people who are writing offers. So um, I, I've had is, I've run into issues in the past with uh, borrowers who actually write cash offers and then they go to switch up to a to a finance solution and some sellers you know are off put by that and it's uh, not killed the deal before but it's definitely put some snags in deals before. Um, so w uh, w what I've seen as, as a good solution to that is you can write an all cash offer but then in your additional provision section. 
um, in the in the offer, you, you know, put something that says buyer has the ability to uh, you know change change financing options if all other terms and conditions of the contract are met. And that way, it takes the the seller's uh, agreement to change the financing out of the equation. Um, and like Adam was saying, we can close in in a reasonable enough time where it's never an issue on our end to execute. Um, but it still gives you that like true you know we're a cash offer kind of situation. Um, I think one thing that was uh, that I wanted to dig into a little bit more was that difference Adam said between uh, institutional hard money and kind of private hard money. So you're going to see, you know, you're going to see a lot of um, interest rate variability and uh, you know leverage profile differences between these these different lenders. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to make this this isn't a, this isn't a talk about merchants' mortgage, right? This is a talk about hard money in general. So, um, you know, we're, we're a piece of it, and I think we execute very well, and, and we're competitive with, with where we are in the space. But, I mean, there's a wide variety of hard money. Um, like, there's, there's a guy, like, like, so Adam was saying, we'll look at Texas. Uh, we'll look at your bank statements to make sure you've got enough money to do the deal. We'll, uh, we'll pull your credit. I mean, I know, but, and we're going to charge 9 to 10%, and, you know, a point, a point and a half to two points, you know, roughly. Um, where, whereas I know a guy who will do, if you do 20% down, and he'll charge you 12% and three points, but he's not going to pull credit. He doesn't care about your taxes. He literally just looks at the property and 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 makes his decision that way. Um, on, on the same token, there's also some lenders, uh, some guys based out of California, or you know, there's some guys out of New York. Um, I mean, Goldman Sachs bought a, uh, a hard money company a couple of years back, and, and they they offer pretty competitive pricing. Um, but but what what those guys? So that's the side I was talking about the 12 and three kind of pricing. Don't really care about you as a borrower uh, financially. You know, that's more private money. Um, the institutional hard money are the guys like the Goldman's we, we kind of fall more into this category as well, where they actually sell these loans to a secondary market. And so you're going to see those underwriting requirements kind of box you in a little bit more because, you know, these, these buyers are buying billions of dollars worth of these loans and they, they need to have these, you know, kind of structured guidelines of what they're going to buy and not, um, to, to make those decisions. So you need to fall into some of those boxes, um, and, and so you're going to see the guys like the Civic to a certain extent, uh, Lending Home definitely. You know some of those other guys. I mean, they they're, they just sell all these loans right off their books and then keep keep kind of recycling that capital. And the way they're able to get that competitive pricing is because they're a little more their hands are a little a little more tied in terms of what they can actually offer. Um, where merchants is kind of a, a cool hybrid model is is we sell our a majority probably 70 percent of our loans off to secondary markets but we also have a, a balance sheet so we have a private equity fund that we've raised um i say it's like 150 million or so um and, and so you know we fund loans with that and then we'll recycle the capital and put that back on our books but we also hold loans to maturity so most of our ground up construction loans if we just like a deal but it's not going to fit in that box to sell off like we'll still do it um we'll just keep it on our books. So, you know, we're able to kind of offer a little bit of that hybrid flexibility um, and, and kind of play uh, in, in, with our feet in both camps, which is, which is nice. Yeah. And our average term uh, with pretty much anything we look at, it's going to be about a, about a year. Sometimes we'll go out to two. Um, and uh, the ability of, like Bob was saying, of keeping things on our books or being a little bit more flexible is we can also cross collateralize. Um, let's say you're asset rich and don't have a lot of cash on the hand right now. Um, we can consider, you know, looking at a, another property or, or something that you might own to, to put a, a lien against. And uh, that way you're not having to come to the table with a bunch of cash, but, you know, you're leveraging the property that you have somewhere else that has a lot of equity in it. Um, that, again, just helps keep more cash in your pocket and get more deals done. Um, another nice benefit to working with hard money lenders, uh, most of us uh, don't have prepayment penalties. You can pay off, you know, as soon as you'd like. And the fact that uh, your debt to income is not gonna change. Uh, the fact that uh, you can have uh, uh, quite a few loans going, different projects like that in, in the works and not have uh, that debt show up on, you know, a lot of credit reports or things like that that other banks will see is helpful. Let, 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 let's, say, let's say that, let's make sure that we say that lying on a mortgage application, mortgage fraud, do not do it. But uh, we don't report to credit bureaus. Um, so, so it, it won't show up on your credit report. But don't not disclose the fact that you have a loan outstanding. That would be mortgage fraud. And then uh, the fact that uh, one of the, I would say the tricks of the trades or something to keep in mind when you are looking at uh, different hard money loans or things like that as far as uh, a little 
uh, number as far as like cash to close or um, different extra things that you might not think of, such as like the appraisal or budget review, you know, tile escrow, things like that. Um, let's say you're putting 10% down. Uh, a, a good rule of thumb is two to three percent in additional costs associated with things outside of maybe just the loan. Um, and then, as far as the kind of the last final things we'll look at um, to to wrap up a loan, is going to be um, a clear title report, and then also property insurance. We're just going to want to make sure there's the right coverage um, on the property, whether it's you know a ground up construction deal or a rehab or anything like that, or just a standard rental. And so um, with that being said, I think Bob's going to dive in a little bit more to the structure and how, uh, how draws work and stuff like that. Well, um, um, just to kind of go back to that insurance piece a little bit, I just ran into this today. We had a deal closing. Uh, we were like 30 minutes before wire cut off and we got the insurance in and it was a homeowner's policy um, instead of like a commercial vacancy and vandalism, like the appropriate policy to do a flip. And so we had to scramble and we got the, we got the correct policy issued like 10 minutes before a wire cut off. So we were able to close the deal, but um, there's definitely a difference in both the type of coverage and the cost of that coverage um, if you're gonna be doing a flip loan. So um, if, if you're if you're getting like a standard landlord policy on a, a property that you're you're flipping, if you're not using hard money, you don't have a lender who's, who's following up. Um, you, you may not be appropriately covered. So if the place is vacant and someone breaks in or someone vandalizes or whatever, um, your your standard landlord policy won't cover that because uh, you didn't inform them that it was a vacant property. So in, instead of paying, you know, six. 700 bucks, 800 bucks a year for a single family house insurance policy, it's going to be more like 1500 to two grand. Um, but with that, you're getting all, there's a higher risk inherent in these deals uh, when, you, when the property is vacant. And so you're getting the appropriate coverage that way. Um, regarding construction draws. So you closed the property, you know, you went through all the approval process. We did the appraisal on the property. Um, everything came back clear. We closed. Uh, you, your next step is actually funding the the rehab on the loan so um, a majority of our borrowers use us to fund the rehab so when we were saying 90 percent it will fund up to 90 percent of the cost of the project we're talking about purchase price plus renovation so um, like if you're buying a property for 400 grand and you're putting in 100 in renovation that's a 500 thousand dollar total cost you're going to bring in 10 percent 50 grand at closing and then our loan covers the balance and so we do construction draws where we'll actually give you a third excuse me, a third of the budget up front to get going on the project. So prior to you doing any work, we'll wire you, um, like in that example, it'd be about 30 grand. We'll wire you 30 grand uh, that you can go and actually use to, to do the project. A lot of other lenders are gonna kind of switch that on its head and make you come out of pocket and, and then reimburse you for the money, um, which is, I, I think it's kind of unfair, you know, for people to say, yeah, we do 90% loans, but then all of a sudden they make you come out of pocket, you know, a, a another 10, 15% um, to then get reimbursed. It's actually more like the 75 to 80% loan in that case. So um, that's definitely something to keep in mind when you're talking to different lenders is how do their reimbursement schedules work? Um, because if you thought that worked one way and then you had to come out of pocket an additional 30, 40 grand to get the project going, I mean, that might be the difference between a successful project and insolvency. Um, so so we'll, we'll fund your initial draw, you go do the work, uh, and then when you're ready for your next uh, bucket of money, it takes about three, five days to do a, a whole draw process, uh, usually on the shorter end. Um, you send in your, your draw request with kind of support around what you've done on the project so far and, and that you paid for it. Inspector comes out the next day, make sure that that's the case, and then we wire the funds to you the following day. Um, I've done, I don't know, five or six different flips using merchants uh, as, as my lender. And I haven't had any issues with uh, the draw process. Um, I also know the whole draw team really well. So, you know, we, we work well together. Um, but Trent, you, did you do the draws um, when you were working on the merchants project? Uh, were, were you the one who was handling that? I'd, I'd love to get a third party perspective on, on how the draws worked. Trent's gone. He's at the bar across the street. <laughs> no, I'm right here. What were you saying? Uh, I, I said, did you run the draw process on the on the loan we funded for you? Yeah. Like, did you do the do the draw request? Can you, can you give a little bit of insight into how it worked? Like the timing was it? I mean, was it a good experience? Was it awful? Um, 
Like, how, how, how did it go for you? To be honest, that was my first time dealing with a draw process in general, and I felt like it was super straightforward. You know, you, you fill out the necessary information, and then you basically send it off with either wire instructions or, or where to mail a check. And then, like you said, three to five days later, you're, you know, you're ready to keep going on your project. So I haven't dealt with other draw processes before, but in my opinion, it was super smooth. You know, you guys have people there uh, ready to answer questions for you. I know I talked with the, what is his name, Fred, or uh, one of the draw guys at uh, Merchants was super helpful. I called him like three times a week when I was trying to figure out how to draw, do a draw process, and he was super helpful for me. Cool. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. That's the same experience I had, um, and, and so I'm, I'm glad I'm glad it was the same for you. Um, but but what the effective effectively what should happen, right, is if we're going on this advanced draw schedule. Because I, like I said at the beginning, I'm all about how do I use other people's money to get projects done. How do I keep my cash in my pocket? Um, after you've made that down payment, like you should theoretically not be coming out of pocket any more cash because the lender should be covering the rest of that, the rest of the deal for you. So it's down payment and then interest payments over the term of the loan is all, you know, you should be coming up with in terms of cash needed uh, during, during a project with us. And, and so, like I said, just make sure that you're, that you're at least aware of how another draw, a lender's draw process works if it's different because your cash requirement may just balloon on you uh, without you really understanding why. Um, so let's um, see what was after the yeah go ahead. One question I have about that for you know people that are here watching, when you say that you'll give that initial draw, you know mm -hmm. what what is typically required for them to show why they need you know thirty grand. So that. I, I, like honestly, you you don't need to do much. My, my draw team will always ask for like information on what you want. Uh, usually, if you're working with a contractor, you can just say, hey, contractor, can you put a list of what you're going to be doing first together? Just so they, you know, so my team can see, all right, this is what generally we're going to be using the money for. If you end up, like, switching up the plan, that's totally fine as long as it's still in the scope of the budget. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I've sent in an initial contractor invoice or, you know, I just kind of put what I, what I had from my budget, like what lines and what percentages of the lines from the different budget items. Uh, that, that, that I was going to be using, and that was sufficient. Um, I, I, like, honestly, our draw team is really straightforward, and, and like you said, if there's issues, you just call them. They're really responsive, and um, I, I think the biggest, where I've seen the biggest hang-ups is either where people are self-performing uh, work, so like we're funding a contractor who's doing it, and, and they might be paying cash to laborers, and so they don't really have support around, like, the payments that they've made to some people. That that gets a little dicey. Like we still manage it and get through it, but like that's where where things kind of come up. If you're documenting all your big ticket items, right? You're saving receipts on the ten thousand dollars of cabinets you bought for your kitchen, or you know, like your your electrician's invoice that you paid, and you can show that you paid it. Um, you know, that's fine. We're not we're not trying to have you document like every screw that you didn't you know put in the wall. Like we don't care about that. We're just like again, it makes sense, lender. Did you generally spend the money you said you did? All right, here's your next money. Let's keep going on the project. Yeah, and then one question that just came in is, um, the question is, you have to make monthly payments, correct? Um, the answer to that is yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes. So, yes, uh, in general, our, so yes, monthly payments are always due. There's always interesting ways that people try to, to pay them. So um, usually we require our borrowers to make cash payments every month. Um, however, depending on if there's enough equity in the deal, like when we look at, you know, perfect example, if, if someone brings in, uh, Adam and I were working on this deal over the past couple of days, if someone brings in uh, a lot free and clear that they plan on building a house on, right, that lot might be worth 400 grand and they're going to put another five or six hundred grand of, of like uh, construction costs into it. So that that loan to cost isn't at our maximum. It's not up at like 80 percent, which is where we would be for a ground up deal. It might be at like 60. So we, we might be able to fund the interest in that case and then put in put the interest payments into an escrow account or have an interest reserve. So the loan pays itself. Uh, but one way or another, yes, interest payments are due. Typically, they're paid cash, but sometimes we can structure interest payments into the loan. 
And your and the monthly payments are interest only with the principal due at the end, correct? Yeah, we don't have any amortizing loan structures. Um, we had a thirty year a thirty year loan product for a minute, and then COVID hit, and it just it, it went away. So um, a, a majority of our loans are interest only. Um, they're paid in arrears. So like you know, if, if you make a payment, if you close, if you make a payment March one, it was for February's interest. Um, and so your first payment's not due until the full, first full month after you close. Um, but, but, but yes, they're all interest only. And then they balloon out at the end. Um, and you either, you know, pay off by selling it or you have a refinance lender come in and kind of pay off the principal balance. Um, and, and that's another interesting question that kind of goes back to the draw piece is how is interest calculated? So um, this is another thing that, you know, if you're, if you're taking notes or you're just keeping the back of your mind when you're talking to different lenders, some lenders are going to charge you interest on the full amount of your loan for the full term, whereas others are just going to charge you on the outstanding principal balance. And the difference there is if you're mid-construction, you haven't drawn all that money from your improvement account, right? Your, your outstanding loan balance is smaller than your full loan amount. So uh, you'll see lenders out there who, you know, you have, like it, it, it happens all the time on big construction projects where, you know, you might have 500 grand out initially, but the loan balance is massive. It's like a million and a half bucks and you're paying interest on that whole million and a half bucks. Um, and, and that, that really hurts. And, and that's, you know, I, we, we don't, we don't do it that way. We only charge you interest on your, on your drawn funds. Um, but that's definitely something to keep in mind because, uh, you know, I've seen people, get into situations with other lenders that they didn't know that. And then all of a sudden they're coming out of pocket like 15 grand a month instead of five, uh, which no one wants to be in that situation. <laughs> um, so, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I think with kind of Adam and then, and then me right here, we kind of went through the whole process. So, you know, we, we get you approved pretty easily and quickly um, look at a little bit of financial information, a little bit of property information. Um, we get the thing closed and, and, you know, we fund your construction draws and it's a fairly straightforward process. And then, you know what, when you're ready to either sell or refinance, um, we usually get a payoff out to the escrow company in like a day or so. Um, and, and we're ready to do the next one. We're also, depending on your capacity, you know, we're able to do multiple loans at the same time. Um, I had 9 million bucks out with one guy once between like 12 different projects. He had a very strong balance sheet um, and, and a lot of experience. But, you know, I mean, we're not just uh, subject to doing one deal at a time. If you're looking at good deals and, you know, you kind of want to get two or three going simultaneously, um, you know, we're, we're, we're usually able to make that happen. Um, did anyone, before I kind of move on, did anyone from the group have questions on kind of the loan process or the, you know, the draw process, approvals, um, anything around rates or anything like that that we didn't cover or you wanted some additional clarification on? Did you, did you touch on what the typical interest rates are for the loan programs? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I can chat about that for a sec. Um, so the lending world got turned on its head during COVID, you know, uh, just like, no one knew what to do from a pricing perspective. All these institutional hard money lenders that we were talking about, like all the back end buyers just stopped funding loans. They were like, nope, we're done. We're not buying anything. So a, a, a lot of lenders, and I mean, you saw, I mean, a patch of, who was it? There were like four or five different builders, capital, patch of land, um, uh, certain lending. So I, could, I can name a few others, but they just, they blanket stopped funding loans for like three months because they were either, you know, kind of uh, risk conscious and didn't know what was going to happen with the economy and COVID or their back end capital dried up or their, um, their, their lines of credit that they used to fund the loans got, got shrunken down. Um, so you, you saw just a massive change in the lending landscape, uh, you know, right around the end of February to mid March. Um, I mean, a great example of that is we went in, in April uh, we were at 10% of our typical loan volume and that stayed for about three months. And then we started kind of ramping back up right now. We're at about 80 to 85% of our pre COVID uh, loan volume. But I mean, you definitely saw a massive hit. Luckily we were still lending because, you know, as we talked about merchants has a balance sheet that we can lend off of. So, you know, we have our own money. We make our own decisions on those deals. Um, we, we got a little more conservative, which, you know, I'll get into the pricing side of things. Um, but, you know, we were still lending. So, 
So pre-COVID, we were doing 90% leverage, um, typically 9 to 10% on the rate, sometimes a little cheaper for strong borrowers, or if they're able to put more money down, we can definitely cheapen the rate up. Um, and then points, which are a percentage of the loan amount that are paid as an origination fee to the lender, typically that was like 1.5% to 2%. Um, so 90% of cost, 9 to 10 rate, 1.5 to 2 points. That was pre-COVID. Um, COVID hits. And we kind of went down to 80% of cost. Uh, so we had our borrowers bringing in 20% down. Um, and we were at a flat 10 and 2. I mean, we, we just we weren't budging from that 10 and 2 pricing. Um, in the past few months, we've started to soften up. And we've definitely gotten back to pre-COVID levels in Washington. So I've been funding a bunch of 90% deals at, you know, mid nines and a point and a half to two points up there. Um, it's a little different in Oregon because of the foreclosure moratorium. So I know a lot of you guys are landlords and know about the eviction moratorium, but there's also a foreclosure moratorium. And you may have gotten letters from your lenders in the past. If you didn't get lenders from, letters from your lenders, then your lender is, uh, that's, that's not legal. They needed to send you a notice saying, hey, we, we can't foreclose on you for not having paid your mortgage um, in the past six months. So because of that eviction, and that eviction moratorium or your foreclosure moratorium is now extended through December. So be, because lenders aren't able to uh, get the properties back legally, if, if our borrowers stop paying, we, we definitely are risk adjusting in Oregon still. So we're still usually at 80 to 85 percent, so 20 to 15 to 20 percent down in terms of the down payment, and like 10 percent rate is is pretty standard. Um, and I'd say two points is also pretty standard. Adam, have you seen any have you seen any deals that we've done in Oregon in the past couple months that have been inside of a 10 and 2 pricing? Uh, no, everything's been 10 and 2. And yeah, the best one I, I think was at that 85%. Yeah. And, and, and we were also uh, asking our borrowers to fund some interest up front. So, you know, put three to six months of interest in escrow. We've kind of tapered that back a little bit. And, um, and, and definitely for clients we've done business with before, or, you know, we have a history of uh, payoffs and repeat performance, um, we're, we're willing to get a little bit more aggressive. But I'd say if you're just a straight up new borrower uh, coming to us for the first time without a lot of experience and, you know, like a just getting started kind of financial statement, um, I, I, would, I would budget for 20% down, 10% uh, and two points if you're doing it in Oregon. If we're doing it in Washington, 10% down and, you know, nine to ten percent on the rate and then one and a half to two points um does that does, i know there's a lot of percentages and numbers in there um if you want me to clarify any of that that i happy to do that but does that kind of help trent yeah well so we have a couple questions that came in one that uh i don't no one typed it but it just kind of popped up in my head was uh for typical lenders when you're buying like a residential house and you came in and you put 90 percent down you only needed a 10 percent loan uh, typically, you can get lower interest rates in some of those situations. Is that the same for hard money, where if someone comes in and brings 80% loan to cost or, you know, down payment, and you're only uh, lending on 20% of the cost, could they get away from that 10 and 2, or is it still going to be that 10 and 2 firm? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yes, short answer. Uh, long answer is our, our capital is, is more expensive than um, your, your conventional lenders. So, you know, Fannie and Freddie, like there's government-backed debt out there that, that, you know, you get these two and a half, three percent interest rates on on conventional loans. Um, whereas our money, I mean, we've got private investors that we're paying anywhere between, you know, six and eight percent kind of kind of rates to to our investors, depending on where they are, or there's, there's equity investors that actually get a piece of the upside. So, you know, our, our money is more expensive. So there's kind of like a uh, a floor where we can't really go below, but yeah, if, if the if the leverage is right and the risk is there, I mean, you know, we've done deals in the mid sevens. Um, I've, I've seen some things go low sevens, and then like like I said, we did have a thirty year loan product, um, and that was I don't know a year ago, and we were pricing low five percent rate thirty year amortization, uh, but you could close in an entity, and you know there was a lot of stuff that made it a little more attractive to investors than your standard conventional loan. Um, but, but yeah, we, we have flexibility depending on leverage, but at some point, you know, we're, we're just going to pass on the deal because, you know, we, we literally, we have to, we have a cost of capital that might exceed, you know, what, what, what your needs are. Right. And then uh, can you restate that 
uh, line that you were talking about that agents are using in the sales contract, um, if they do fill yeah. out the, you know, they check the, the box and then. then yeah, they I, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't think there's any like specific verbiage, but you know, basically if you write something in there where you buyer has the, has the right to, you know, change the financing provisions of the purchase and sale as long as all other terms and conditions of the contract are met. You know, something that basically t takes takes away the seller's right to complain and potentially hold up the deal or twist your arm if you change the financing. Um, I mean, that, that's the basic thing. Because then you can come come in with an all-cash deal and, you know, before you need to get your proof of funds in or whatever, you can kind of switch it around to a, to a bank deal. Um, you know, again, there might be some agents out there who say, hey, is that misrepresenting yourself? Maybe you have the cash to do it. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just saying I've seen that work in the past. Hey, Bob, I'm just wondering, I love some of your uh, ideas on, like, if you had $100,000, you could uh, borrow 900000 and how that all worked. I know there are a lot of realtors on here, so they're not just looking for them, but also their clients and kind of looking at where their needs might be. Can you give us some example, more examples of, exactly different ways we can use you guys and things that might, you know, besides just construction and maybe flipping, but just uh, more specific ways that we can use your money. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me switch out my earpiece. My battery's dying. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think biggest thing to start by saying is we're a commercial purpose lender only. So we don't do any, um, any owner occupied financing. We can't, uh, the, our, our license with the state is only for commercial purpose. So, you know, we're not regulated by Dodd-Frank. Uh, if, if you're a realtor, you'll, you'll like this. Uh, you know, we don't have to wait for like the three D three day closing disclosures and like all that other nonsense. I mean, that's where we can close deals so quickly. Um, but, you know, we, we get people who ask us for residential loans all the time and we have to decline them. Um, so if, if, you're, if your client is doing an investment purpose deal and, and needs to close quickly even, like I, I had a person, I have a person who, up in Seattle um, and she uses us consistently. She puts down like 30, 35, 40% um, on these deals and she only uses us because she wants to close in like three days and then she refies us out two weeks later. Um, and we charge her like a point and a half and she's happy to do it because she's got enough cash and all she's trying to do is tie up properties. So, you know, I think closing speed um, is, is, is definitely great and, and kind of a way to get in there. Um, another thing that I'll get into is uh, with if, if your clients are doing the burst strategy or they're buying rentals um, and they're trying to get in, basically they're trying to refi all their capital back out of the deal um, after they've stabilized uh, and, and they want to do it inside of the, uh, six month seasoning requirement. Um, we've got some creative loan structures that can uh, that can help achieve that goal, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. But basically, you know, any sort of like rental program that has a value add component, like that's a great use for our for our money. Obviously, flipping or ground up construction. Um, if you, if you dabble, if you're any your clients dabble in the commercial world, um, and and the property's not bankable, we can we can touch that too. Uh, but definitely, where where we're not going to be strong on is coming in to a rental property with like 20% down um, and, and holding it for 30 years. Like you don't want to be paying eight to 10% rates for, for that long. Like you want to get into the term financing. Another, another question is how does it work if you're reassigning a contract as a wholesaler to an investor? Can you get a proof of funds letter uh, to secure the property for the investor while I mean, it waits to, to close? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, like I, I have, uh, I, we work with a lot of wholesalers and, and there's some lenders out there that won't fund wholesale fees. We do fund wholesale fees into the total cost scenario, as long as it's not like an egregious wholesale fee. Um, so, I mean, I just funded a deal in Seattle yesterday. There was a $45,000 assignment fee on there. Uh, we funded it at 90% of cost. Um, we just want to make sure the as is values line up in that case. So, um, yes, we work with wholesalers all the time. Uh, yes, if you qualify financially, um, and, and you need a proof of funds letter, uh, even if you're not, you know, going to end up closing the property, you end up wholesaling it, like stuff happens. Um, so yeah, we can definitely work with wholesalers to get properties tied up. And then, you know, we love it if they're able to pass this off to their, their end buyer, uh, to actually close the loan. But, you know, I mean, like I said, we, we work with wholesalers all the time. 
Cool. Do you, I have a um, client asking about other countries. Do you work with people in other countries too? Or? So we do work with, we do, we do work with foreign nationals. We, we, we only lend in the, in the U.S. But um, like Seattle's a great example because it's kind of a tech hub. And so, you know, there's a lot of people on, on H-1B visas and, and, you know, various things where they're coming in uh, to do very, you know, high finance tech work. They've got a lot of money in the States. They might have some assets in the States, but they're, they're foreign nationals. Um, we, we will lend to foreign nationals, but we usually require either an additional piece of collateral. Um, so if you've got a house, you know, can we toss a second, you know, and it's not your primary, but if it's a rental property, can we toss a second on there in addition to this, this property? Just so, you know, if, if everything went sideways and you left the country, we've at least got a little more security around the loan. Um, so like, like a lot of my answers here, yes, we do it, but there's a little more structure that's involved in those deals. Right. Um, were any other, just keep, keep your questions coming if you have them. Um, so there, there's a few different things and we kind of touched on some of them, but that I wanted to talk about where you can kind of get creative deal structuring um, and involved with hard money. I, I, saw, I saw this question, is the credit requirement the same for wholesalers to secure a proof of funds, even if, got it. Um, wh whoever, whoever this was, to, uh, Tanisha, connect with us offline. Um, I'm sure there's a way that we can get, that we can get like a, a proof of funds letter for you or kind of work, you know, work collectively to, to help you tie up deals. So just we'll give our, our email at the end, give us a call or an email um, and we'll, we'll get that worked out. Um, so, okay, so, so a couple different strategies, like if you're not just gonna just straight buy a property, put 10% down or 20% down um, with hard money. Uh, so the, the Burr strategy was one thing that we were talking about. I know Tony you know, gave us that, that deal update today. Um, and, and actually, Tony, would you mind if I asked you a couple of questions about about like the numbers around that deal? If, if you're there, just log on. I'd love to. I'd love to kind of make it a real life scenario. But um, so let's just say that Tony uh, bought the thing. I he bought it for like two fifty or something. So you know he probably put twenty percent down. Um, so he probably put fifty grand down on the deal. Um, and he, and he said he was gonna you know do the do the rehab work, retent at the spot, and then in six months. At, at, at a cash, when he gets to the point that he can do a cash out loan with a conventional lender, he would go to the lender, pull his money back out. If he was able to do that in a shorter time period, so in like, you know, a month or two, he was able to just quickly rehab the place to get it all. Hey, Tony. Hi. Hey. Um, so you, you bought that thing for, for 250 right? Yes. And, and what's, your, what's your rehab budget that you're thinking about putting in on it? Um, 50,000. So I'll be in it for roughly three and it should be worth and, and probably you, 380. Got it. So you'll be able to get a 75% takeout on the back end? Yeah, eventually. Yeah. But then like, okay. like you um, mentioned, like if this still, so if the conventional loan didn't work, then I would go like to you guys, then probably you guys will ask me a like, 15% down. And sometimes you'll give me rehab budget on top of that too. So, and then of course the interest rate is roughly 10%. And I've yeah. done those deals before well, and I. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, well, so I guess what I was going to say is, so if you're doing a $300,000 deal, it, it, it basically, if you were able to get that rehab done in like two months or a month and, and you wanted to refi, you still have to wait that six months to, to get the cash out seasoning period, right? It's so correct on the conventional loan, you have to. Or uh, my other strategy is I'll go to like a commercial bank and do a blanket loan. Um, but I have to tie up a couple of other properties. In the past, other lenders will um, structure where I put in the down payment, but it's kind of like on the side note, but then they write the whole principle on the, um, you know, the debt or whatever. And then I could go and do rate and turn with the regular conventional bank within that six months period. But once it's paid off, then my money's, my down payment or security is returned after it closed. Yeah. So that's, I'm, I'm, that's, 
Perfect. That's exactly what I was trying to talk about. So we, we, we do that all the time with our burst strategy people. So if, uh, you know, if, if you've got a long-term burr, like it's going to take six months or longer mm -hmm. to, to do this project, then it's probably better to put the money down and just do the cash out. But if you can get the thing done in like a month or two um, and you don't want to burn all that hard money interest waiting, you know, just, just paying for six months so you can eventually do a cash out, yeah, we can do a larger loan amount on your settlement statement and then hold your down payment on the side. So when you go to refinance, it's not technically a cash out loan. We can, they, can, they can refi up to your loan amount. Um, and, and so that's, that's a pretty um, often used tactic for a lot of our clients to, you know, not keep cash tied up in properties, but to really start, you know, that whole money velocity scenario. Um, so that was so that was one that was one strategy, and, and we we use that pretty often, and, and uh, a lot of our clients have really good success with that. Um, you know, I've, I've seen people take take the same thirty thousand dollars and go and buy like six properties over the course of you know a year and a half with it, um, instead of you know doing one deal and getting it tied up forever. Uh, so that that's really creative. Um, another uh, another strategy is what Adam talked about, where if you've got another property, um, you can use that as a down payment. So you know if you've got 60% leverage property or something, you know, we may be able to come and put a second position lien um, on that property and use that as your down payment. So there's another way to not use your own cash, but use some equity you've got set aside. Um, and, and now in finance theory, it might be a better st a structure to go and get a HELOC at a cheaper rate, take that money out and use it as the down payment instead of, you know, me basically pay, having you pay 10% on it. Um, but if you're not able to get the HELOC or we can move more quickly, you know, that's another scenario to use cross collateral. Um, another way that I've seen with, to great great success is people using second position financing. So some lenders they won't, uh, some hard money lenders won't allow second. Um, a lot of the institutional guys won't, and and, and we do. Um, so if you've got you know an equity partner or a, a guy who, who you know we, we know some people. So if you don't have money to do a deal, basically is what I'm saying. There are ways to get these things done. Like I can I can introduce you to some people who might be willing to lend you know, your down payment in second position, it's going to be at a high, high interest rate. Um, but, you know, if you don't have the cash and you'd rather pay someone a little bit of money to get a deal done, like there's ways to do that. Um, and then the last strategy that I've seen used uh, quite often is seller carried financing. So if your seller has a fair amount of equity in the, in the property, maybe they, instead of you going to, you know, someone and asking for, for a second position note, maybe the seller will carry a second position note for you. So, you know, you're buying the place for 500K and the seller owns it free and clear. Maybe they carry a $100,000 balance. So we're going to give them the 400 grand. So they're going to have a lot of cash they're walking away with anyway. Maybe they carry a hundred grand for you because they like you or you built that relationship or that's the only way the deal is going to get done. But, um, you know, using, using subordinate second position, subordinate financing um, through seller carries or, or through, you know, other, other high net worth people, you know, who just need a place to park money. Um, you know, is a really good way to get deals done. Like you don't need to think about you having to go this alone. Like, I think that's my favorite part about real estate is finding a deal and then figuring out how to structure it and figuring out how to structure it with none of your own money in it. Um, so like, I, I think that's really where the creativity and, and, and you know, kind of getting those almost infinite returns. Like if you put in zero dollars and you made a hundred, like that's an infinite return. And so I always try to get as close to those you know, crazy infinite returns as I can. Um, the, the last piece that I wanted to talk about is when to not use hard money. And um, I've got some experience in that because there were a couple of projects that I've done where I should have worked harder to find a different capital solution. Um, because I, you know, basically if you're doing a land deal, if you're doing a rental deal, if you're doing any sort of like thing that's going to take longer than a year or has an unknown you know, kind of variable outcome. Like for me, it was a land division project in Portland. Um, I thought it was going to take nine months. I hired all the right people and whatever. And then you start working with the city and delays and, and, and whatever. And you get to a year and a half on a project that was supposed to take nine months and you're paying 10% interest. Like your profit goes like that. So I think hard money is best, like we said at first, when you're doing a short-term bridge and you need high leverage, to, to buy and stabilize. But if you're ever doing something where you don't know what the timeline is going to be, or you know it's going to be a long timeline, it's way better to find, to, to get to give, give an equity partner a, a bigger piece to bring in some money 
to work harder to find some other financing solution than just like going and using hard money. Like hard money should be a last resort in those cases. Um, I mean, another deal, like I just, I bought an eight unit apartment complex in February with, um, with, with a buddy of mine and we, we used hard money to buy it. We were going to flip it in a month. Um, we got a good deal on it. We weren't going to do anything, just put it back on the market. February, COVID hits, no one's buying real estate. Um, we, we had tenant issues. Uh, we were bleeding, like three of our units weren't paying and we're paying hard money rates. Um, and I mean, we were bleeding like I think eight to 10 grand a month on this deal. And, you know, you start looking at what eight to 10 months of negative cash flow looks like for a year. I mean, you know, you can have liquid reserves, but it hurts after a while. Um, so we, I mean, we ended up working through a refi and then right before a refi, we got a, uh, right before a refi closed, we got a, we got a purchase offer. We ended up selling the place and, you know, we're, we're fine. We're out of it now. Um, but like there are times when, you know, things can go wrong. And so thinking about that ahead of time, so you don't get into a situation where you're just like kind of trapped paying interest, you don't have any other outs, um, or, or at least having the liquid reserve to kind of get you through those times is really important before you get into deals that, you know, come with any sort of uncertainty around the timing of your exit. Um, so I think Bob, for, Go ahead. Yeah. Bob, for that example, I mean, no one can predict a global pandemic coming on like that. So, you know, in that situation, I like how you talked about having the cash reserves necessary or having a backup plan. Uh, I know your, your guys' plan A was to just sell in a month because of the good deal you got on it in the first place. Do you think someone should try to line up like a refinance earlier in the process just in case they need it or talk to a more conventional lender uh, only if it needs to happen, you know, if you get caught in a pinch? Because I know traditional lenders tend to take a little bit longer. And sometimes if you are caught in a, between a rock and a hard place, you don't want to, you don't want to stay there for too long. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, a hundred percent. Like I said, I, we lined up conventional lending. Um, and, and, and I want, I mean, that's a, That was a conversation that my partner and I had uh, two days after we closed. And, and I said, hey, like, let's let's start the refi process going. If we sell this thing, you know, we, like, we'll, we'll, we'll sell it and be fine. Even if we refi and pay a point, like, it is what it is. Let's, let's get out of this. Um, we, we dragged for 15 days and then COVID hit. <laughs> we, we were kicking ourselves for sure for not getting started uh, sooner. But, um, yeah, it, 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 I, I highly recommend no matter what your project is, that you always get into it thinking about exit strategies and thinking about having like five different, like the more exit strategies you can have on a project, the, the better off you're gonna be. Cause if plan A and B and C go wrong, at least you've got like B and E to fall back on. Um, and so, you know, I mean, like, like we, we had raised some pre preferred equity for that apartment complex. And so, you know, we were talking to our prep equity partner about rolling into true equity and getting like a special allocated bonus depreciation split um, to kind of make them happy in, in, in tandem with, with, with our refi. So, I mean, you know, we, we, were, we were looking at our debt stack, at our equity stack. Um, you know, it was two fourplexes that were side by side. Like, do we sell one and keep one? Um, it, I mean, we ran into legal issues with tenants. Like, like I mean, I, I had a cash for keep a tenant plus legal fees. I paid like, I paid like 15 grand. Um, like in the course of two months, just to like cash for keys, a tenant. Um, so it, it, it was just, it was an absolute mess of a project. And I'm just giving this example because I mean, this stuff happens. And when you're sitting in that kind of negative cash flow situation, like you want to make sure that you either plan for a contingency of cash up front or you have like good exit strategies and a lot of them uh, to be able to, to execute on. I thought my 3,500 cash for keys agreement was bad. Well, I mean, it was, it was lawyers. Uh, we paid for both sides of the lawyers. We paid the cash for keys. It, it was, it was be, because of the eviction more, like, like we were in the right, but then, you know, do you wait until the eviction moratorium is over to actually go to court? Um, you know, all the courts were closed uh, and, and this guy knew it. He just, he, he just knew he had us. And so he just squeezed us. Um, and at the end of the day, we were, you know, it, it was, we, we would rather pay him and get him out and get the place retenanted than, yeah potentially not have rent come in for six months and potentially be on the hook for all of the, the stuff that he was, he was talking about, you know, cause I mean, Multnomah County, the, the judges are, are very tenant friendly, even if the law, even if the law is on your side. 
Uh, and I also, just because we're talking about COVID and all of this stuff that's happening, I've seen on the residential side a lot with my loan officers, my lenders, uh, some changes that they're having to do. One of them is that they're having to go out and take pictures of the property before they close on something. Are you guys doing anything like that that you've had to change uh, because of COVID or because of the fires? No, our... Um... Our closing process has stayed pretty consistent. So we do need to get inside the property at least once before we close and that's to get an appraisal done or some form of valuation. And that's stayed pretty consistent. Um, I, I, have, I have seen where it's been more difficult to get inside the properties, especially if they're tenant occupied because some people claim COVID issues or whatever. Um, but, but I haven't noticed as much of an issue with that. Adam, have you seen anything that's like really kind of blown up the, the logistics around closing? From a no, like you said, everything's pretty much staying the same. It's just the uh, a lot of people are a little more COVID conscious, and as long as we can get the the valuation done, um, that's that's all we need. Yeah, and I think I'm yeah. just seeing more on the fire end. They want to make sure the homes are still standing before they're loaning any money on it. So it's been interesting to see that uh, on the title side that they are requiring this of some of the the lenders. I've, I've noticed out in where I live, out here toward um, east of Oregon City, there's been a lot of um, appraisers, kind of insurance agents, different people like that going out there doing a lot of that stuff as well. Just a lot right. more traffic. <laughs> yeah. So, in, you know, going along this, this topic here, I know for, you know, one of the deals that we've done, we uh, had to get, the, it was such a quick turnaround that we did the appraisal after closing. Is that no more right now? Yeah, Adam, you take that. Um, that, it, it's all going to depend on the, the client, the history we have with them, and then the, the deal structure. Um, uh, it is something that we can still consider. Um, a lot of times we do that with people that we've either worked with before or if there's some sort of extenuating circumstance. It's deal by deal. I, 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 closed, I closed the deal yesterday without an appraisal. It's going to be post-closed. Um, and uh, what, what happens there a lot of times is say we're going to do a 10% down loan. We'll have our borrowers bring in 20% down and we'll hold 10% on the side. And when the appraisal comes back, if it's satisfactory, we'll give you the money back. So that's a way to kind of risk adjust on our end, but still make the deal close and kind of get the borrower whole, you know, in a week or whenever we can get that appraisal. Got it. Like we said, it's all about that common sense. I like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is like, there's never like it. I, I I'm a deal structuring guy. Like I like just, having a client bring me a, like a, an issue, like a deal needs to close in two days and there's a seller problem and, and like, how do, how do we solve all this? And like, it's just, you know, you kind of put the puzzle pieces out there and you say, all right, like, like what's the, like, like where's the leverage and where are the buttons we can press it? How do we get this thing done? I mean, you know, I've, I've negotiated seller financing on behalf of my clients before I've sourced like second position loans for people. Um, you know, I've, I've been a broker on deals before for people. Like I find my clients like, like deals to buy. So, you know, I mean, I, and Adam's the same way. Like he, like he brings, he brings clients off market deals and things like that. So, you know, I mean, we're, we do the lending side of things, but I think we take our job more holistically and say, all right, how, how can we help our clients get where they're going? Not just from the debt side of things, but, you know, finding deals, putting total capital stacks together and then, you know, kind of executing on the back end. I mean, finding contractors. I mean, we, we'd kind of, if there's, if there's a need of our clients, like we kind of go where the need is and then we try to fill it. And like Bob says, it helps the fact that we are, you know, investors ourselves and brokers and lenders, you know, and different things like that, where we kind of have been in those shoes where, you know, I know how it is if I can't find a contractor or I've reached out to Bob plenty of times on different deals that I'm working on personally. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're all we're like everyone in my company or everyone on my team, at least I got a guy up in Seattle too, Like we all do real estate development deals in addition to doing this lending stuff. So, I mean, you're getting like a very, um, investor focused mindset when you come and work with us and i i can attest to that i think these guys know their stuff around the real estate world and i would recommend them to anyone um i i think that's it for the questions if you guys have anything else to wrap us up feel free to throw it out there if not we have a couple more final announcements and then we're out of here so i i put my contact info on there um, and I think Adam put his, his info on there as well. So like, if you guys have any more questions, um, like feel free to reach out to us. 
you know, you know, Adams, Adams crushing it in Oregon. He like, you should totally go to him for any sort of Oregon deals that you guys are coming across. If you got Washington stuff, like love to talk about it. I think our other loan officer, Brandon is actually on this call as well. Um, and so, you know, uh, Brandon, if you want to put your um, contact info in, in the comments as well, um, like any of us can help you with your deals. Um, I have an Excel sheet that's kind of like a flip underwrite Excel sheet. I'm, I'm a total Excel nerd. Like, you know, I said I have a background in CPA and blah, blah, blah. So I, I'm going to send that out. To, or I'm going to send that to the Uptown guys to send everyone on this call. Um, use at your own peril. It's, it's, it's really detailed and kind of granular, but like it gets the job done when it comes to really calculating out what interest costs are going to be over the term. Like it produces a cash flow, a monthly cash flow. to like whatever, you, you know, your, your deal is going to look like. Um, so I'll get that to the uptime guys in the next day or two. And if you guys have questions on how to use that or, or, or whatever, I mean, feel free to contact me and, and we can kind of talk through any sort of deal questions, structure, et cetera, that you have. Awesome. Bob and Adam, thank you guys so much for your presentation. Like I said, I was super excited for this topic because I know um, a lot of investors are interested in it. And if they've never worked with hard money before, it's definitely a good learning experience. So thank you. Uh, my last final announcement is uh, next month's event, most likely going to be virtual again, just given the circumstances and the uh, rate at which they're progressing. We are going to be talking about self-directed IRAs with David Moore from Equity Advantage. I've actually had him on my podcast before, and the guy is awesome. He knows his stuff, and he loves to talk uh, 1031 exchanges and self-directed IRAs, which he makes those topics pretty fun and interesting, which sometimes those can be cut and dry. So make sure you're on the lookout for that. Once again, Bob and Adam, thank you so much. For your presentation tonight terry thank you for getting this all uh put together and remember if you haven't uh if you're not logged in on your own zoom call or haven't given terry your email yet for your ce credit make sure you do that terry do you have anything else i don't thanks for everybody for coming if you have any needs if you have any uh homes that you're wanting to sell or purchase please let me know we would love to be your preferred title company and if you need any marketing or uh farming maybe helping to get uh investor names things like that uh let me know about that as well i'm here to help you and it again was great meeting all of you uh bob and adam thank you yeah and tony thanks for uh, hopping in today and sharing about your deal as well i hope everyone stays safe and healthy and uh, has a great rest of your evening thanks for joining Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you guys very much. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.